Today we have a very special guest with us who has traveled from Oshkosh. John Wass is a working artist and member of the Very Special Arts Wisconsin Board of Directors. He will share with us today how his disability affects his life and work. He is here in conjunction with Door County Reads and the Creative Power Exhibit, a juried exhibit by persons with disabilities from age five and up. The 2002 book selection for Door County Reads is The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. After his presentation, we would like to take a walk through the exhibit together. Thank you for coming, John, and welcome. Again, my name is John Wass, and I'm here on behalf of VSA Wisconsin. Um, just to give you a little bit of background with VSA, um, VSA Wisconsin is an affiliate of VSA, a program of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts located in Washington, D.C. VSA was founded by um, Ambassador Gene Kennedy Smith in 1974, and our affiliates here in Wisconsin incorporated in 1985. In 2011, nearly 3,000 individuals participated in VSA Wisconsin programs. In addition to the Call for Art and Traveling Art Exhibition, VSA Wisconsin conducts artist residencies at early learning centers and in schools, coordinates nine community choirs throughout the state, and conducts visual art, music, and movement classes in Madison. Each year, artists with disabilities submit art, original artwork to the Call for Art you see downstairs. Independent arts professionals serve as jurors and have the difficult job of selecting purchase awards in three categories. Young, which are ages 5 to 15. Young adult, which are ages 16 to 21. And adult, 22 and up. The award-winning works are chosen based on originality, creativity, and craftsmanship. And the top 10 selections are added to the Creative Power of VSA Wisconsin's traveling exhibition. The works then travel around Wisconsin for a period of three years where they are displayed at corporations, libraries, museums, and galleries. In addition to working with VSA, I am also on the board of directors. Um, and I've had a lot of experience on both sides of receiving um, benefits from them and helping them get them for people. So I'll be talking a little bit about VSA throughout my talk about my work and my life to kind of tie it all together. So, um, I'm here today to kind of show you the power of art and to show it to you in connection to people with disabilities and in people, uh, to people in general. Um, first, I'll start out with just a little background on myself as it's very important to uh, the art you'll see. Um, I was born in Wisconsin, um, in Lena, up near O'Connell, O'Connell Falls, so uh, it was pretty rural up there. But uh, I always loved art. It was something that I could do um, when I couldn't go out and run around like the other kids or play rough um, because of the fact that I have osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a genetic bone disorder that causes um, weak bones, among other um, medical conditions. But primarily, my childhood was peppered with fractures and hospital stays and surgeries, um, lots of repairing of broken and bent bones. So. Art was my escape from all that in a way. And it also, I think, gave me a sense of control over something as I felt completely out of control in my life. You know, a <coughs> break could happen at any time, whether I just slipped and fell or got mad that Sesame Street was over and slammed my arm on the ground and broke it. <laughs> <laughs> at least that's what my mom tells me. Um, so right away in my childhood, art was a part of um, who I was. Um, in high school is when I really started to get serious about it. And I had known I wanted to be an artist my whole life. Um, well before I knew what an artist was, my mom likes to make the joke that um, I used to tell people I wanted to be an arsonist because I couldn't say the word. <laughs> it's funny though, because now I work with glass and that involves a lot of fire. So in some way I am an arsonist. <laughs> um, but in high school, uh, I started out with just drawing out of magazines and books, and I love perspective. And this is one of my early drawings I did in high school. It's a pen and ink. I designed the house and then drew it in perspective. Um, it won best of show at a, a regional art competition in Wisconsin, and then it got to go to Washington, D.C., and was displayed in the U.S. Capitol for a year, and I got $100. 
So that that really gave me, you know, that boost. I was a freshman as well, and I was competing against juniors, seniors, and sophomores as well. So that really gave me confidence, which, which as a young adult and child was one of my weakest things. I had no confidence. Um, and art was something that, that I could hold on to with confidence. Um, this is a stained glass on top of a mirror, actually. This was a gift from my stepdad. He's a hunter. Um, I saw a woman doing stained glass on TV when I was younger, and I fell in love with it immediately, with the process, with just the way it worked. So in high school, I tried it, um, and I took a class and you know, kept dabbling on my own. And this was one of the, my bigger, biggest projects I did first on, um, on my own. So this started my career with glass, basically. From here on, I just started to experiment with many different types. Um, when I graduated high school, I continued with the stained glass, and this is a lamp I made um, in experimenting with that. It had 13 sides, I think, and 250 pieces of glass, about. Um, another stained glass I did um, after high school. This one, I don't know if uh, anyone here can see, but there's a face in it. This one um, I just did just to do it. And um, it actually ended up being bought by a salon in Appleton, so it's in the perfect place. But stained glass, I'm not sure how many people have ever tried it or are familiar with the process, but um, one purchases sheets of colored glass that are manufactured, and the colors are numerous. There's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of colors and manufacturers doing different things. So um, you pick out your glass, you cut it into pieces like a puzzle, and the cutting is done in different ways. I use a, a glass scoring tool, score the glass, and then it breaks, and then I grind it down to fit. And then I have to line each seam with metal and solder it together. And then that's what holds the whole thing back together. It, they can take a very long time, depending on the amount of pieces and the shapes that are used. Um, and then when I got into college, I started to experiment with um, what's called lamp working. And that's where you take um, glass rods and tubes and you melt them together in a torch. And you create things like marbles, perfume bottles, Christmas ornaments, glass pendants and jewelry, um, little mini paperweights. This one over here actually on the left is a marble. And so is the one in the top right. And then the lower the lower right one is actually a paperweight. It has a flat bottom, so it won't roll around. It's just a mini paperweight. A note, a sticky note weight. Um, but in college is when I started to, I had always drawn, and I've done a little bit, I had done a little bit of painting with acrylic and oil starting in middle school. But um, I had no confidence in doing portraiture. And so I took some classes in college and um, focused on that, focused on the figure, the person. And this is one of my mid-range um, charcoal pieces. I had been drawing for a little while now, so I could pull out something like this. But this is just a friend, and it was on my way to becoming a portraitist. But in high school, like I said, I had no confidence in portraiture. So when I did, when I started to um, create this kind of stuff, it was really uh, empowering for me. This is a chalk, just a couple for a wedding gift. So I started playing color after I learned how to charcoal. And then this is just one I did for fun. <laughs> it's actually a watercolor and chalk pastel. And it, it is just one dog. She's just kind of <laughs> it was, uh, Her name was Sandy. She was my chihuahua in college and a little bit after. She passed away a few years ago, but um, 
this poster still uh, I enjoy it a lot. I have another Chihuahua now that I plan on doing something with with her with like this too. But all the background is watercolor and then the dogs are chalk. I saw an artist mix once the two together very well and it inspired me to do a couple like that. Um, but the same professor that taught me to do portraiture um, taught me something more important. And that's how to do self-portraiture, something that I absolutely despised in high school because I had no confidence. and um, I, I had done a few, but only because it was a, an assignment in school. So this is another assignment that a professor did, but, or had us do. And he wanted us to do a portrait of more than just yourself, like yourself, uh, your physical self, but your kind of your past or your ideas or whatever you consider that makes you who you are. And so I chose a watercolor. Um, well, actually, I think this was in watercolor class, so that's why it's in watercolor. But um, you have me looking back, and there's a boneyard and a scalpel to represent my past surgeries and breaks. Mm -hmm. And then the storm in the background just is that kind of symbolic symbolism. Uh, and then the path, obviously, of how far I've come. And then I also, at this point, had had enough surgeries on my legs. I had rods put in my femurs, so now I could walk a little bit. And so I felt like I was a little bit more free from the chair. And that's why you see that sitting back a bit. Um, and then I'm looking back. And so this one um, kind of got me a little bit over doing the self-portraiture. You know, I'm, it was kind of an in-between self-portrait because I'm not really looking at you, looking away, looking back. But I ended up entering this into um, a call for art through VSA International in Washington, D.C. And this was the second time I um, even heard about VSA. The first time was when my art teacher in high school got me a scholarship, or didn't get it for me, but she helped me get it um, to UW Oshkosh, and VSA was the sponsor for the scholarship. So. Um, the second time I heard about them was a call for art in D.C. And they called artists from all over the country, ages I think 16 to 25, that have a disability of some sort, whether physical or a mental, emotional. And um, so I entered this, and I won Best of Show um, and got $10,000. <laughs> so I got flown to D.C. and spent a few days there. And um, they ended up buying the piece as well, and it showed in the National Press Gallery, and in, I, can't, I can't remember the other um, public location offhand. But. So this one really broke me of my self-portraiture problem a little bit. It showed me that there could be value in it other than just for myself, but the real value I've come to find was for myself. And so I started to do more self-portraiture, kind of creeping in on the idea of myself, not going just doing self-portraiture. So this was my idea of uh, my life at the time, where it was a mixture of doing art and then dealing with my disability. And so I kind of threw them together. And this one's called Work to Do, because I always felt like I was either painting or healing, and it was always that work being done because um, when I got out of the house and out, out from under my mom's wing, realizing how much is involved in health care for yourself and how much initiative it takes, this painting is kind of that symbol for me, that you have to work just as hard as the doctor. Same concept. Um, I, had, I had plates in my legs when I was younger, and that's what that symbolizes. It's a bar screwed into the side of the bone. They don't do it too much with my disability anymore. Now they do the rods that go down through the marrow canal. The problem with the plates is the bone still grows, and you're left with a huge part without a plate. 
And right where that plate ends, it would just break over and over. The last time I broke it before they took it out, I was swimming and I just kicked my leg under the water and I heard the crack echo. I was at school. So then we knew it was time to come out. Um, and then I started to incorporate the idea of my bones and osteogenesis into my glass work. And so this is a glass sculpture, glass and ceramic actually. Um, and I call it osteogenesis imperfecta. What I did is I made each bone individually on the torch um, and it's colored with silver. That's what gives it the yellowish, um, amber color, blue green. It goes many different ways. And then I fuse each bone together and then the base is ceramic. And it's pretty self-explanatory to me of why I would uh, make a glass skeleton. But it uh, show sparked my, sparked the idea in me when I was um, younger. It was called Children of Glass and it was a show about my disability and I thought, yeah, that's true. And I, it's funny because I already, I had already been attracted to glass before that, so I had some sort of natural attraction to it. And then this is another one I did, but instead of fusing with heat the bones, I silicone them together to look like cartilage. And then I found that also gives shock resistance to shipping and moving. And if it breaks, you just have to put that finger back on. You don't have to. It was an experiment. And then this was one of my last ones I did like this. Um, this one is actually holding the arm bones that was once part of it. While I was making it, it was all fused together and it broke off and fell on my table. And so instead of starting over, I decided to use it as a symbol of resilience, as a symbol of making the best out of the worst or making lemonade out of lemons. But all of those were ultimately in study for my senior project in college of a full glass skeleton. This one sits on a pedestal and it's probably a little bit higher than I can reach the top of the head. If, if it could stand up, it would be two feet tall. And I call this one imperfect bone origin, which is the literal translation of osteogenesis imperfecta. This one's colored with both silver and gold. The silver is the kind of yellowish color, and the gold is the more reddish pink color. And the reason I did that was because I wanted this to kind of be a, a map of my fractures. And so anywhere you see a gold or pink look is where I've broken a bone. And I even tried to form the bone in the way mine has grown. Um, and then there's also one of the plates from my femur. They give them to you after they take them out. You know, they're clean. And then they... I put that on one of the bones of the femur as a symbol. Excuse me. Yeah, questions, by the way, anytime. What do you, I mean, does somebody buy that? Or do, do they do display it at some place and they just keep it forever in some spot? Or what happens to something like that? Well, that would be the ultimate goal. Right now it's sitting in my studio under, in its own little container. I've shown it many different places. Um, I won Best of Show with it at an orthopedic surgeon convention in San Francisco several years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm hoping that it gets bought to be displayed publicly someday. I don't know when. Um, it's a very precarious, intimidating piece for people. They're very scared to buy it because, <laughs> because it's a glass skeleton. Um, but I have sold several of the other, the hands. Um, the first one that I did, the University of Wisconsin bought that, and it's in their library right now. And then the second one I did, Senator Herb Cole bought that because he likes to collect art. Um, and then the, the third one, you just the last one that I finished, a friend of mine is trading that with me for a painting. So people do enjoy them. I can get rid of them. It's just this one is very intimidating. <laughs> Um, but while I was working with the glass and sculpture, I was doing more self-portraiture. And this was the second assignment my professor had us do with portraiture. This was a few classes later. Um, he wanted us to do a double self-portrait. One, one of the portraits showing how you view yourself 
and another portrait showing how you think others view you. And so this painting I call Gemini because that's exactly, I'm a, I'm a Gemini. But I always had that feeling um, growing up of my reason and my emotions fighting each other. And also that people thought I was more courageous than I really felt. And so this is exactly what that symbolizes, that people saw me as um, courageous in my wheelchair and that I go through all this stuff. But that's not at all how I felt. And I would almost hide behind that sometimes. And, and it didn't, that kind of attitude did not help me. And it led me to, to a point where my spark had died, where I no longer wanted to continue. And I needed, I needed to go in a new direction. I needed to find a way to find that confidence that I've been missing, even in the face of being able to paint well. And so I started to look back into my past more. And this is um, the first in a series of paintings that go together of 12. And it's to represent 12 weeks in a spica cast. And I've had, I've had several spica casts up to the age of 21. And that's where you have to have a cast from your chest to your toes for several months because you, if you break a femur or a hip, um, you cannot move your torso or in the hip area. So, I wanted the 12 paintings to show 12 weeks, one painting for each week, and to show the emotional sort of roller coaster that you go through, and uh, just to get it out. It's almost like my diary. And so this first one, um, I called the series Rectifying, because I see the casts as rectifying not only physically my bone or whatever's broken, but they stop me. They, they forced me to sit and think, um, to go over things, and to not just let things go. And so in a, in a sense, the last series, of, or the last um, Spike cast I had was very much like that, because it was when I was in college. And so I really thought a lot. And the first one of Rectifying, you can see there's an image of me. Yeah? What medium is that? This is oil. Oil, oil on canvas. Um, the, the ghostly me is the way I feel because generally whenever I have a spica, it's because I had a, a significant surgery. So I wake up very groggy and on lots of drugs, pain pills, everything. And so that's how I feel. I feel disassociated from myself and not really knowing what's going on. But I'm not going to show all 12 paintings. So this, this actually, this I think is number three. Um, and I'm waking up, things are still a little fuzzy, can't see everything, but the pain only lasts for the first three weeks to a month, and then you really, you're just bored. And so this is usually about the seventh week. Um, when I'm feeling better, I start to have more visitors, and this is my, this painting is my ode to family and friends. Um, they come and they uh, bring me things, and make me forget for a while, books, games, all that stuff. You can see they signed my cast, and with the paintings before this, the signatures increase more and more, so you can see the time progression. And, you know, that lasts me a couple of weeks, the games and the books and, you know, everything uh, is kind of forgotten for a little while. But then, by the ninth week, you know, almost two or more than two months sitting in bed like that, well, it's not as if I was just sitting in bed, but being trapped in that cast, um, I had a reclining wheelchair, and I even went to school one time with it. Um, but it's very, very different life when you have one of those on, I'll tell you. And so the boredom sets in. It's been too long in this cast, but by the 12th week, I'm free. And it, this painting is just um, trying to describe that feeling of being free. I can't quite describe it to people. Um, it's kind of a reminder that I should 
that I always should want to continue to do things because there will be times when I can't. And so it, it is that kind of motivation sometimes for me. But there also comes to the question, well, what do I do? I'm better. You know, I've been sitting in this, you know, everything I've been doing was to just get over this, but now where does my life go? And that was a big question for me. And so I started to travel with friends and stuff, and I went to the Grand Canyon. And this was something that I wouldn't have fathomed doing when I was younger, going away from my parents, sitting on the edge of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> my mom freaked out when she saw this. But <laughs> <laughs> um, and this one's called Gemini United, because by this time I, have, I felt more whole as a person and not struggling against each other, myself, I should say. And so this was when we worked together to reach the top, to reach our goals. Um, which in this case was to get past the disability. Excuse me, I have sure. one more question. Mm -hmm. any, any questions? Right? I can see the painting on your screen, and I can see it here, and the painting on the screen is much more... Better. Is it better? Is that the word I want? It's darker, it's more intense, Crisp. and this looks kind of washed out. Yes, that that's the case of the projector. Okay. There's not much. Um, it, and then even with this, the original blows this one away. So. Oh. You can never get a perfect copy, or at least I've never seen a perfect copy of a painting. Um, the eyes are better than any other machine that I've... The other question I have is, did you actually go up there? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, I was climbing the rocks, I was right on the edge, and then my friends took some pictures of me. I kind of made this Grand Canyon up, mm -hmm. but the, the actual me sitting up there is a real picture. I use photographs often at this stage in my career to just I'd get lots of different ones and Can combine. I ask, how did you get up there? Well, I wheeled as far as I can, but by this time, remember, I'd had the surgeries, and I could walk enough and climb enough, and I had friends there, and I really didn't have a problem with... And, the, you know, I went to the best edge I could. I didn't just <laughs> go climbing down to some weird place I thought looked cool. You know, I kind of made it up, too. Um, but I started to look into the psychology that I had once had. And uh, this painting is called Pity Party. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. So this one I did, well, to give you a little bit more of a background of this collection of work that you're seeing now, is I was approached by Ripon College to do a show, at, um, a solo show there. And it was pretty quickly after I graduated and they had seen some of my self-portraits and they asked that I do a show of self-portraits. So this was one of the paintings and they actually purchased this one. Um, and it's just to show the futility of self-pity. Um, it goes nowhere. Uh, it was my old view of life. Um, and I thought that suffering was getting over suffering. I had this view that getting past or just getting over suffering was the goal of life. But actually, once I got over the suffering, I saw that the goal has to be much more than that. It has to be seeking something. And, and, I, and I see life now as seeking joy, not escaping pain. And when you do that, the pain becomes very minimal in the scope of everything, in my opinion. It's all in how you look at it. Um, This was my uh, way of dealing back in the day, but it didn't help me. It led to depression and anxiety. And then the different people are kind of different aspects of the emotions, the different <coughs> colored shirts, you know, always feeling different, no consistency. But I did leave the pity party, and this is the painting that represents my leaving the pity party. Um, this one is my view of my psychological change of life, or my psychological view changing. Um, you can see my, there's some of me over on the left, and then there's a few left over on the right, still at the pity party. And then all that stuff on the floor, some of my paintings, you can even see one of the cast paintings. 
so I was painting my paintings in the painting. And that's to show the things that helped me get over the pity party, the learning and the, the artwork. And you, this, there's Sandy. She's another one, dogs, pets, people help you get out of that too. And really what I'm just trying to do is coax the other guys away, get out of your head, look at the world. Um, there's a lot to do out there and have fun. So once I finished this painting, I showed it to UW Oshkosh and they bought this one eventually. So Ripon College's pity party and my alma mater has leaving the pity party. <laughs> Um, and then this one is, I had to do something as the opposite of pity party, the exact opposite. And so this one I called commemoration, where my emotions and my ideas and thoughts are um, working on myself to get better, working on my self-image rather than <clears throat> just dwelling on the negativity of it, but to create a new self-image. Um, George Bernard Shaw has a great quote that says, uh, life is not about finding yourself, it is about creating yourself. And I absolutely agree with that, that we are people of uh, self-made character. And so you can see that the five of me from the pity party are all now wearing white shirts because I feel more cons consistent and um, how large is that original painting? This one is the biggest painting I've done so far. It's four feet by three feet. It's so beautiful. Thank you. It's about as tall as I am, so that's about as tall as I'm going to go. Um, I guess this painting symbolized for me is that happiness is not achievable without some form of self-esteem. You cannot look out into the world and enjoy it if you can't stand yourself because you are the one that views the world. And so to go along with that line, um, I did this one called Self Made and it's the very same idea that uh, we choose who we want to be. Um, the actions we take build our character. Character is habitual action. And so I've got um, Reason on the left, looking out at reality, and emotion on the right, looking at me. Emotion, I think, are tools to tell you things about yourself, and your reason are tools to tell you things about reality. And so they have to work together constantly. And I had done so many self-portraits by this time that I figured I might as well just do one of me painting myself. <laughs> um, it's a little bit M.C. Escher, but with my own style on it. Um, yeah. And then here's another piece, self-portrait. Um, it's called Clarifying Self. And it, it might be hard to see what's going on, but I've got a mirror sitting on my easel that I'm looking into. And then I've got all my paints and stuff sitting on a shelf behind my easel. This one, um, and then the, the hand coming out, out of the mirror is, to sh is my symbol for showing that your ideas and the things that you think of can become real. They're the building blocks for what, um, for what we do. So that's why it breaks the bar barrier of the mirror. But then I also, did this one and called it clarifying self for this point I made earlier about having to see yourself well before you can expect to see reality well. It's like not paying attention to the condition of a microscope when you're looking at s cells or something. It just seems self-evident to me now. But meanwhile, doing all these portraits, I um, 
continue to do portraits of other people. I just love to do the portrait. Um, I do many commissions, wedding gifts, all that kind of stuff. This is my great grandpa. Um, it's charcoal. This is an oil painting, um, a friend of mine. Seeing myself more clearly also has helped me see others more clearly and to see what's in them, that, uh, that fire within them, and to try and capture that. It's my sister. And then here's one of my, well, I should say I did this a year ago already, but it's a, no, two years ago. I did this um, with a mirror. I just set up a huge mirror in front of me. And uh, it's, it's four feet tall by two feet wide, I'm pretty sure. And this one um, is just to show like where I've come to now. I used to not be able to do a self-portrait at all. Now I can do one straight looking forward in the mirror. It's to symbolize my found confidence. And I call it headstrong, um, partly because my mom always called me a bullhead, but I see that now as a good thing. <laughs> and if you look back to self-introspection, how much it's changed my view of myself, the fact that I, like I said, I'm looking forward in the new one, not looking back looking out at the world. Um, and then the reason I have my brush in my hand like that, obviously, is to show that I'm a painter. But I also see the brush as a tool of measurement, because back at clarifying self, I had the brush sticking out. When an artist does this, have you ever seen artists do that? What, you know what they're doing? They're measuring reality. They're measuring relationships of things. Um, you could do it with a ruler if you're working with a photograph, but you can't do that when you're working from life. So I see the brush is also a tool of measurement. And then this one I entered in um, Richeson, Richeson's an art um, supply store and a gallery in Appleton. They have a figure portrait competition. And in 2010, I won best to show with this painting there, so $3,000. And then this one is my, this one is my newest self-portrait. I can say that for sure. Um, this one I call the fire within. And it's just kind of pulling everything together. Um, something that I see where VSA comes in is people have this, people with disabilities have this fire that needs to come out, but it, it feels often trapped by your disability in some way or respect. And that's where VSA came in for me, is they gave me the means to really go for what I wanted to with the $10,000 award. But I've also entered the call for art that's downstairs, and I've won a few times. Um, my art was retired, so it's not down in the traveling exhibition anymore. But um, all those kinds of things, the little awards here and there, really, really help on many different levels. And I actually had to judge one of the children's traveling exhibit shows. I don't think they have that with the one down there. Not as big as the one I had to judge it with. And just the kids were so excited to see their work up and people talking about it. And then to get an award, oh my gosh. I got to give a talk at one of a couple of the award ceremonies, actually. So uh, I get to meet the kids. And, uh, but the fire within 
is kind of my purpose for doing art in a way, as I see this fire within everyone, most people. Some let it die and let it go out. I see the fire within as the drive to face existence eagerly and consequently causes you to live life to the fullest. It is the source of all your desires and motivations. It gives you a childlike anticipation to face the day and to do what you want. It gives the energy in any struggle toward reaching your goals. It basically is the energy to seek, keep, and attain the values that make life worth living. But we have to discover what fuels our fire individually. It starts as a childhood spark, an excited joyfulness about life. But a spark is only momentary. It must become a self-perpetuating fire, shining its light for more than just a moment. And then with fuel, your fire becomes a blazing inferno within you, like a star whose sheer massiveness is the source of its own existence. Your internal fire must be big enough to last your whole life. It must be stoked and always protected, for it can fade and go out. It is essentially up to you, as you are the only one that has complete access to it. This painting, for me, is an introduction to the concept of self-motivation and concretizes the source of my work and my motivations in life. Many individuals give up on creating or just their dreams in general, but I want others to see that their inner flame or spark must be cared for so that it doesn't go out. We must find what fuels our sparks individually and protect it with all we can. Just like we protect our heart, our eyes, and our food, your inner fire must be looked after just as carefully. You may be able to survive without the fundamental burning within you, but you certainly cannot live without it. And this is what I want this painting to show. I see the flame within me when I wake up, if I want to paint or if I don't. But some days it isn't there, and I have to find the reason why uh, to keep that fire burning. So many artists I've seen quit, and nine, I think it's a percentile of 90% of art students don't do art after they leave art college. So not that I don't think anyone's destined to do anything, and maybe they found something they like better. but. There are a lot of people I hear and talk to who say they love to do art, they just don't do it anymore, or they don't get to do it. Or, and so I like to kind of stoke that flame within them if I can. And the fire within, seeing this within me and with others and seeing how it has to be stoked showed me what my purpose in art has to be. Um, this is my largest stained glass I've ever created the tree of knowledge and it symbolizes for me the knowledge of that fire within and how it has to be kept alive. Um, this is my dining room window so that I'll never forget and it's also my dining room window because I could never find someone to pay for something this large. <laughs> how, how large is it? It's about three by four feet. It's a little shy of that but it has 2,293 pieces of glass. Some of them formed by me, all of the rest cut by me. And so this piece is a reminder of my goal. When I started doing stained glass, I was doing little 15-piece things, and now I've reached this. So it reminds me every day that just because I don't feel like doing it today or because I have a bad day and everything breaks or whatever, because stuff still doesn't always go right. Um, this is a reminder that, yes, you can do it, just keep perseverance, I guess, is the key. But this also shows me, um, like I said, my idea of art. And I think that art should be to show how things could and ought to be. Not to tell, but to show in an experience. And this experience should be a reminder that gives motivation and inspiration in the face of day-to-day -day struggle. We just need to be reminded that happiness is achievable, here, now, in this life, and, the, and that the struggle is worth it. When I didn't think it was worth it, or possible, it led me to give up, 
to let my flame die. I realized that even with all the help from others in the world, it wouldn't matter if I didn't think that my happiness or goals were possible. I needed to see it from someone else because that knowledge gives me the courage to continue. Everyone needs to see it. And this realization led me to what the goal of my art should be. Art should show a view of happiness that is real as a reminder of the supreme goal, goal to be reached. Art is like a beacon atop an enormous cliff giving you something to focus on when the struggle of getting to the top becomes trying or painful. I want my art to be that beacon, a reminder that the top is worth reaching. Thank you. I hope with that you see how powerful VSA and things like that could be and how powerful art can be for anyone, disability or not. I have a question. Yeah. Do you teach any art? A little bit. Um, I do workshops and residencies at schools here and there. I've done it for almost 10 years now, but not full time or anything. I've even done one-on-one -on -one students. What media do you teach? Um, primarily my best is I go in and do pastel portraiture demonstrations and workshops. Um, pastel, I can relate to both drawing and painting for people. So, um, the chalk pastel. I was struck by all of your self-portraitures you. that your hands are strong and beautiful in all of them. Is that, was that consciously painted or did you <coughs> just paint and then notice that that's I, the way it it's, came. It's kind of both. I, because I, when I see it happen, I could choose to take it out or leave it in. But I know my hands are my symbol for, they've never broken. You know, I broke a finger here and there, but nothing big. But um, that was very noticeable to me and very yep, beautiful. My hands are my feet. <laughs> <laughs> so I see them as being important. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Prior to the cast paintings, yeah. did you, knowing this was coming up, did you, did you consciously take that opportunity? I am going to work through this through my art. So did people take photos of you? Yes. That you could get that perspective? Well, actually with the, the cast Spica series, I didn't have photos of me in a Spica. Oh. Um, that Spica, the second half of my body, I made up in all of those okay. pictures. Um, the top half, I just laid in a bed and had someone take pictures of me in different positions, and then I like I do what I always do and put pictures together. Um, I'm that's one of my main goals in art is to be able to just paint without too much reference at all. Mm -hmm. My professor in college could do it extremely well, mm -hmm. um, so it's one of my goals, and that's I always try and do something in my painting that I'm not referencing. Okay, I was just thinking that. Before you went into that, that 12 weeks, was it? Yeah, well, I, I had several of those. Okay. Probably when I was a kid a couple okay. times. I don't remember okay. exactly when. Okay. And then in high school, I think I had two episodes um, over the four years where I was okay. in a cast for three okay. months. And then in college um, was one of the few times where I did know it was coming. Mm -hmm. um, it caused me a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to take a semester off of college so I could stay with my parents and they could take care of me while I had the cast. But... Um, but so I knew it was coming, and I knew that I'd be thinking a lot. But I didn't have the idea for that series that until came after. that came after. Oh, okay. And then you posed, and then mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Interesting. Do you prefer glass or paint? <laughs> I can't say. I still ask myself that question. <laughs> um, I use them as breaks from each other, <laughs> literally with glass. <laughs> Um, oftentimes I have something of each going on, and sometimes I'll work on one in the morning and another in the afternoon. Um, I just really enjoy the process of glass very much, and painting obviously too, but um, because painting is what I try and focus on more in my career, um, the glass is more of to make money. Um, but I, but I just I really do enjoy doing it, making all the different things. <coughs>